How would you feel if you knew right now that someone was out there using your name, your ATM card, your credit card, your checks, your checking account to give themselves a little personal shopping spree? Now, a few of you might say, ha, that joke's on them, Pastor Scott. <laughs> they picked the wrong person to impersonate. You see, I have no money in my account. My credit cards are already maxed out, and they'll be declined. See, I wasn't planning on paying most of those bills anyway, so it really doesn't matter. Now, that might be your case, but for those of you who spent your blood, your sweat, your tears building a good name, a good credit rating, the idea of having your identity stolen, your reputation ruined by an unknown imposter out there, well, it gets you a little hot under the collar. And rightly so. See, identity theft is one of the fastest growing forms of crime. They estimate that maybe $50 billion just this year in the U.S. alone was lost to identity theft. And in case you haven't heard, what identity fraud is, is it occurs when a person gets a hold of your social security number, your bank numbers, your credit card numbers, and they begin to use your name and those numbers to apply for loans, to charge up goods, to live off of your resources. And in its mild form, of course, it can be just kind of an inconvenience. A few false charges on your credit card, they cover it, they call, they give you a new card, and no harm done, really. But in many cases, and growing number of cases, the identity fraud is so sophisticated that it can go on undetected and cause major trauma and drama in a person's life. I had a friend who literally spent years recovering from the damage done to his life by the fact that somebody had impersonated him, stole the names and numbers, and done all of these things. But as troubling as financial fraud like that might be, spiritual fraud is even worse, even more damaging, even more far-reaching. And this series that we're looking at here in 2 Peter has been titled Real Life. And as Pastor Pedro talked about last week on this subject, people want something real when it comes to God. That's what I want. I don't like imposters. I don't like all the fraud that goes on out there. But I titled tonight's teaching God Fraud. Why? Because part of real life is that there are fakes and frauds. Anytime you have something real, you're going to have something fake. And so you see 2 Peter 2, Peter's a little hot under the collar. He's mad. He's fired up. Why? Because of false prophets, because of false teachers, because of false doctrines, and the damage done as a result. In other words, you see Peter very upset about God fraud. Now, Peter uses some extremely strong language, some strong words in this chapter here. And I think it's good for us to remember that this is not Peter's word, but God's word that we have in front of us. This is what God thinks about God fraud. This is how God feels about his name being misused and abused. He's not happy about it. He feels strongly about it. Now, before we get into chapter two, again, I want to give a quick review. In, in chapter one of Second Peter, God is revealed in all of his goodness. Again, I think that chapter is about as clear on the goodness of God as any chapter in the Bible. The real deal we see in Jesus. The real life that God has promised to those who follow him. And, and again, it's a free offer that God gives. There's no fraud to it. There's no catch to it. Great and precious promises that have been given to those who follow after Jesus. From the prophets, the true prophets. And you see, even the last part of chapter 1 talks about these prophecies that are fulfilled in the life and person of Jesus. And if you look down on your page, you'll see chapter 1 concludes there in verse 21. And I'm kind of paraphrasing it here, but it's basically holy men of God brought us the Holy Bible through the Holy Spirit. That's what he's saying. A lot of holiness there. A lot of goodness there. And you see, God has a well-deserved good name. His word is his bond, and it is 100% trustworthy. Spiritually speaking, you see, God, in, to use the analogy, has an excellent credit rating. I mean, he's a guy that you can trust. If he says it, he's going to do it. 
100% faithful, 100% true. And so God has riches untold, you know, grace, mercy, in abundance. He has every good thing, a righteous reputation, well-deserved. Again, God, the real deal, if ever there was one. And that brings us to chapter 2, and we see the first word in that chapter changes everything in the thought, which is the word but. That little word just changes everything. And you might say, but what, Peter? Well, if you read on as we will tonight, you'll see Peter is now going to address not God, but God fraud. Hypocrites who impersonate God. Spiritual folks who supposedly speak for God, but when you really look at the sur below the surface, that's not what's really happening. Those who misuse God's name for their own fame, for their own fortune. And you'll see, Peter doesn't mince words. And again, I remind you, this is God's word, not Peter's. So it's God not mincing words when somebody were to ask, well, how do you feel about hypocrisy, God? Well, we need to just read this chapter to find out. This is an important part of the role of a pastor. You see, Jesus told Peter directly, feed my sheep. And that's a big part of what it is to be a pastor, to feed God's people. But you know what? Part of that pastoral role also is to warn God's people to do what we call whack-a-wolf around here. There's a game over at uh, Chuck E. Cheese that's uh, whack-a-mole where you just have this big mallet and you, and you get to hit these things. It's a very uh, good game for kids. Uh, but I enjoy it too. But, it, but we call it around here whack-a-wolf, you know, where you say, wait, let me warn you that there are some wolves out there because otherwise all a pastor is doing if they just feed the sheep and never warn about the wolves, what are they doing? Well, they're just fattening them up for the kill. And so the first point tonight, in some ways it might be a little bit of a heavy teaching, but sometimes we need those because the first point tonight is that believers must also be unbelievers. Believers must also be unbelievers. So let me share with you what I mean as we read verse one here. It says, but there were also false prophets among the people even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And verse 2 says, Many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. Now, just stopping right there, again, reminding you that first point, which is that believers must also be unbelievers. What do I mean by that? Well, it's great to believe in God, but don't believe in God fraud. Don't believe in God frauds. I mean, don't be a gullible Christian in the sense that we need to learn to discern. What does discern mean? Well, it means to be able to tell the difference between what is true and what is not. See, what we believe as Christians is very important. But what we don't believe as Christians is also really important. And sometimes believers are just believers, you know, and you go, hey, here's a lie. Oh, well, I'm a believer. I just believe whatever comes my way. I don't learn to discern. And so God frauds out there, false prophets find easy prey so often in the church, false teachers. Literally, the Greek word there means pseudo. If you, that's the, the word there, pseudo, pseudo prophets, pseudo teachers, fake, false, fraudulent, imposters, a pretender. Again, what we're going to see tonight, a prophet for profit, ripping off God's people and taking his righteous reputation and dragging it through the dirt, using Jesus' name but not having his nature, not sharing his nature. See, if you'll note something with me in verse one, it's really important to notice these words. It says secretly, secretly, sneaky. That's what it's talking about there. It also talks about them being among. Again, Pastor Pedro pointed out last week that if you can't beat them, join them. See, sometimes Satan will attack from without the church, but if he doesn't win that way, he'll just attack from within the church. See, that's what it's saying. While no one's paying attention, while no one's watching, well, it can be so easy for destructive heresies to come in. The King James Bible puts it even more strongly, damnable heresies. You know, in other words, things that lead to hell. They come from hell and they take people to hell. And he says they're denying the Lord. Now, again, when you think about secretly, of course, denying the Lord, if someone comes in here and says, 
I don't believe in Jesus. Well, that's not very secretive, is it? That's not very stealth. That's pretty straightforward. And some people would say that, but there are others who are sneaky. Oh, they'll talk with you about Jesus. It's just not the Jesus of the Bible. Oh, you believe in Jesus? I believe in Jesus. The longer you talk with this person, you start to realize, this is a different Jesus than I've been taught. This is a different way than I know. And sometimes it's the subtle lies that have the most destructive outcome. Why? Because few fall for obvious fakes, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but if I'm in a store and I see a Rolex spelled R-O-L-E-C-K-S, and it's a bargain, I go, a Rolex for $9? Wow, that's a deal. I wonder why the time's wrong. Well, they probably just didn't set it. I wonder why the second hand's going the wrong way. Well, I don't know. Gucci, you know, G-O-O-O-O-C-H-I. Wow. No, see, again, fakes have to at least approximate the truth, don't they? And I was talking with someone just the other day after a Bible study, and they said, you know, I started going to this little Bible study, and everything was real cool up front, but man, things just kind of got weird somewhere along the way. So I'm coming back, and I just don't think I'm going to go there anymore. You see, have you noticed that even the kookiest cults, even the kookiest, craziest things, at least base their false beliefs usually on the Bible? They point to the Bible and say, oh, oh yeah, we believe the Bible. Now, of course, the thing is, it's usually very obvious to anyone who knows the Bible, its actual contents, that these people are picking a path through it and doing all kinds of crazy things. It's one of the reasons that we feel so strongly about teaching all the way through books in their context, like we're doing here tonight. But it's usually an obvious distortion of the Bible, their own books in addition to the Bible. Oh, we believe in the Bible, and these books help us understand the Bible, you know? Big stack of all that stuff, because the Bible, you really can't understand it, you know? But our prophet understood it, so here, let him help you. And they'll quote heavily from the Bible, right? Talk about the Bible very glowingly. Claim to be following it. Pepper their language with Christianese all over the place. Man, you're using the same language. We just mean totally different things. Well, have you ever wondered why they don't just throw the Bible out altogether and start from scratch? I have, but I figured it out. You know what the reason is? They want to benefit from God's good reputation. They want to piggyback on his good name. The Bible is real. The Bible is true. The Bible has a strength to it. It goes a long way back. But some guy will come along, and if he starts building his foundation from scratch, everyone says, forget that. But if he says, oh, I'm building it on the Bible. Really? I don't know the Bible, but that guy seems to. Let me trust in him. They'll add to it. They'll subtract to it. They'll pick a path through it, misrepresent it. But very rarely will someone just ignore it. Why? Because you lose all the power of it when you ignore it. And counterfeits have to be based on something real or no one falls for it, right? Again, nobody's counterfeiting monopoly money. And if you are, you probably need to adjust your strategy a little bit there. <laughs> See, not all God frauds are obvious whack jobs. You know, we, we can all think of those ones that you go, oh, yeah, yeah, the Kool-Aid guys or, you know, the, the compound guys and the, the guns and rice people and all that sort of thing that... But see, it's incredible to think about it, but right now there are people in pulpits calling themselves pastors and reverends and priests and bishops and all kinds of things, and yet it says right there in verse 2, they denied the Lord who bought them. Now, maybe you don't recognize the name George Barna, but he is well known and has done, uh, their organization has done tracking of religious trends over the years for many, many years, and they do in-depth research. Some recent results just, you know, I, I almost have trouble believing it, but this is what they found. Over half of those preaching from pulpits in America do not believe that Jesus was actually born of a virgin and do not believe that he literally resurrected. You know, they'll say, oh yeah, well, we believe in the resurrection as a philosophy, as a concept. It really doesn't matter whether he resurrected bodily or not. That's really not the point. And yet they call themselves spiritual leaders. In my opinion, I hope in yours, you know what they're doing? They're using God's name fraudulently. 
They are committing spiritual identity fraud right there. God fraud, the same way that an identity fraud person, a thief, takes your name and your reputation and ruins it financially. Well, false teachers and false prophets like that rip off the name of God. They ruin his reputation spiritually. And you know what? I just feel like saying, why don't you go get another job? I mean, why, if that's what it is to you, if you really want to dispense of this, why don't you do something else where you're not destroying people's spiritual lives? See, you think about this. It's a scary thought. Verse 2, God's word says, many will follow. Many will follow. See, it wouldn't bother me so much if you had frauds who would just go be a fraud and nobody fell for it. But the sad part is some of the biggest churches out there, some of the most successful ministries out there, many will follow destructive ways. And you know what will happen? People will blaspheme God as a result. That's what it says. People will find fault with God. People will blame God and blaspheme God as a result. Blame God for the fraud, as if he was the one who put them in that place. And any time I talk with people about the Lord, inevitably, people will talk about frauds, about cults and crooks, and say, well, you know, I'm just not into the God thing because of this, and they find fault with all of that, right? So this is why I say so strongly, believers must also be unbelievers. You need to know what you believe and why, but you need to know what you don't believe and why not. Don't assume that just because somebody carries a Bible and seems to know a lot about it and uses spiritual sounding language and has a following somewhere or some kind of charisma that they speak for God because it's not necessarily so. Learn to discern. The best defense, a good offense. What do I mean by that? Learn the word of God for yourself. This is why I feel so strongly about it, to not just feed folks from the word of God, but to say, hey, learn to, learn to, to discern. Learn to know and handle God's word well for yourself because that's really what's going to give you that. And any church that is not confident with you learning the Bible for yourself and wants to make sure that they are the ones who do it, well, beware of that. Why? We're not afraid of you reading your Bible. We want you to read your Bible because you will find the truth there. So again, cults and false teachers, they prey on believers more than unbelievers if you look at the statistics. Very interesting. The studies show that cults, most members don't come from just the heathen world. You know, they're not out there taking people from the gutter and all that kind of stuff. You know what they're doing? They're preying on churches. Praying on people who already have a spiritual thirst, but they don't have a spiritual knowledge and foundation that would immediately make them say, what that person's saying is false. It doesn't line up with the Bible. See, this is what happened. Many people come from a church background where maybe they didn't teach the Bible that much. So they have a respect for the Bible. I believe it's God's word. What's in it? I don't know. So along comes a person holding that up, has a lot of charisma, and says, this is what God's word says. Take my word for it. And what happens? They follow after that person. Damnable heresies start and damage people's lives. So open to manipulation. It's one of my desires as a parent. I want to make sure my kids don't just grow up in church, but they know God's word. Because it's a real scary thing to think a kid who's got a spiritual hunger, but no knowledge. Open for manipulation. What's the motive of God fraud there? Look at it in verse 3. This is what it says. Lays it right out for us. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. See, the thing about deceptive words is, the thing about it is if we knew we were being deceived, we wouldn't be deceived, right? If you knew it was fraud, you wouldn't fall for it. If an email came to you and said, I am trying to defraud you and take your life savings, you wouldn't go, well, I'll respond to that. No, it, it, it has to have a sense of, Something else, deceptive, covetousness. That word means greed, money, power. Watch out for these things in your own life. Watch out for them in the lives of others. Exploit, that word literally means to make merchandise of. It's kind of fascinating. The word deceptive, where it says there, if you go look at it in the Greek dictionary, you know what it means? Plastos. It means molded from plaster or clay. Something that looks real but isn't. If, if he were writing today, I can imagine, P, imagine Peter saying, watch out for plastic, man. Look out for things that are molded and, and fake. 
And see, with some frequency, we get these letters here at the church. You know, this is Calvary Chapel Kindle, but we'll get a letter from some ministry, and it says, Dear Mr. Kindle. There you go. <laughs> I don't think that's it. You know, dear Mr. Chapel, uh, you know, that sort of thing. I was praying for you today, and God gave me a vision of you putting a $100 bill into this response envelope here, and God told me that he would give a hundredfold increase if you did that. Well, the sad part is, you know, I sent that in. I didn't get my hundredfold increase. I'm kidding. I didn't fall for it. But people fall for it. Why do you think they keep sending them out? Because people keep sending it in. Now, what's God's response to that? Well, it's the same response you should have to it. On one level, we laugh at it, but another level, it's no laughing matter because judgment's going to come because of that stuff. Second part of verse 3, it says, For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. Now, it's kind of interesting because he's saying for a long time their judgment isn't idle. You say, well, what does that mean? That means this, that God will wait but when he's done waiting, it's going to be very swift and decisive. See, that's the way God is. Why doesn't God wipe them out now? That's kind of what I would do. If I was God, I would just say, any fraud, i just burn them immediately. Now, why does God let people get away with things like that? Why does he do that? Well, it has to do with who he is, and I'm glad he's who he is and not who I am. See, God has a good name and a well-deserved reputation for righteousness. And if you look at one of the things that he has, it's long-suffering. He is merciful. He is patient. He's slow to anger. Genesis, I'm sorry, Exodus 34, verse 5, you see Moses saying to God, show me your glory. Tell me who you are. And God, in a moment there, set, passes in front of him, and it says that God gives a description of himself right there. This is God's self-revelation. It says, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but by no means clearing the guilty. So he says, hey, when my judgment comes, it's going to come. God is very slow to judgment, and I personally am very thankful for that in my own case, you know. But he is going to judge. And when he does, it will be swift, it will be severe, and his judgment will be just as perfect as his mercy has been. And Peter lists some example of God's judgment, unless we miss it, there in verse 4 through 8. Read it with me. We'll just go look at them. And you see it says in verse 4, If God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into change of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And if God did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, if he turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, you know, just pausing right there, what he's saying is, look, God has never let God fraud go forever. See, God will give a God fraud, a fraudulent person, a fake person, an ungodly person, time to repent, but eventually he will not spare them. That's the words that are used there. He will not spare. And let's not lose sight of God's goodness as we're looking at man's badness. You know, again, as you look at it, there's always that balance in the Bible. You know, when you're just about to say, I can't take anymore. Okay, verse 7, he says, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Now, if you know the story of Lot, I don't think there is a better example in the Bible of the fact that God is merciful and patient. I mean, the life of Lot, I mean, if ever there was a half-hearted kind of partial believer, it's certainly Lot. You see him, a lukewarm Lot, I like to call him, a compromising Christian, just a guy who, who kind of, sort of, you know, there he was, kind of. And he lingered, and, and he lost so much in the process. But this is so interesting. It says in the Bible the angels pretty much had to put him in a Holy Spirit headlock and yank him out of town, dragging his heels the whole way, saying, no, 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 don't save me, you know. A saved soul, a wasted life. Is it possible? Yes. Is it desirable? No. And so you see here, verse 7, 
again, I love it because he says righteous lot, righteous man, righteous soul. It's almost like Peter had to remind himself that Lot really wasn't one of the lost folks. And this is a good thing to remember. See, there's a difference between flawed and fraud. See, sometimes God's people, because they're flawed, will start to feel very condemned, you know. Oh no, I'm, you know, I, I must be one of the hypocrites. Listen, hypocrisy isn't the fact that you fall short of God's glory. Everybody falls short of God's glory. Hypocrisy is when you don't care. It, it, when the gap is growing between what God is and what you are, and you just don't care, and you want to pretend to be something you're not. See, Lot was flawed, but he was not a fraud. And so Lot fell far short of God's best for him. But he did have a real faith in God and that led to his righteousness and God saved him. So I always keep that in mind. But again, you see in verse nine, that's why God can speak so strongly on true hypocrisy because he says, I don't have any patience at all for that. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly, verse nine, out of temptation and how to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. What's that saying? It's saying God doesn't deliver the righteous right away and he doesn't judge the unrighteous right away. He's saving it for a day in which those distinctions will be very, very clear. Maybe not all the time right now. So many parables Jesus told made this same point that he said, you know what, there's gonna be wheat and there's gonna be tares and there's gonna be true and there's gonna be false and they will grow together, but God knows the difference. And so he says, deliver, rescue, rescuing out. And I love it because he talks there about temptations. He talks about trials. And everybody goes through those things. And that's one of the things that sometimes makes a difference between people. You get to find out when the heat is on, you get to find out what comes out of a life. And so Peter here continues his rant sort of against God frauds, you know. Verse 10. It says, especially those. These are the ones that really bug me. Those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and they despise authority. They're presumptuous. They're self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. It's talking about spiritual powers there. It says, whereas angels who are greater in power and might don't bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. Now, we already looked at the fact that believers, sometimes we need to be unbelievers. You know, we need to look at something and test the spirits, as the Bible says. It says, don't believe everything. Believe the God things. Know the difference. Learn to discern. And one of the ways we can do that, this is really the second major point tonight for your notes here, is rotten fruit, rotten root. If you think about that, especially if you have a gardening background, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. It's a biblical principle you will see. I use this principle all the time. This has brought so much clarity to some of the confusion that can be out there in the world. Rotten root, rotten fruit. Rotten fruit, rotten root. You know, the opposite also true. Jesus said, good fruit, good root. You'll be able to tell these things. Now, if there's a rotten root, there will inevitably be rotten fruit. The root, what is that? That's the invisible part of every person, the heart. See, I don't know it. I don't know your heart. You don't know my heart. You can't see it. God can. I can't see yours. God can. But Jesus said we can and we could and we should judge fruit. He says it's okay to do that. In fact, it's absolutely crucial to do that, to learn to discern the visible part. He says you can do that. To judge a person to condemnation, that person's going to hell. No, I I, I don't know that. God knows who does and who doesn't. And It just said he's going to reserve that for the day, you know. That's his job. But my job is certainly to be, in some sense, in my own life and in the lives of others, a fruit inspector. See, I look at the result of a person's life. I look at the result of my own life and my own belief system, whatever it is. Over time, is there reconciliation or wreckage in a person's life? If you look at a person's life and all there is is just wreckage behind that life and they have a belief system, you go, well, I don't know what you believe, but I know what you live and I know what's going on there. Is there reputation with those who know them best? 
Is it the worst reputation? Oh, man, if you really knew this person. You know, their, their circle of friends and enemies, man, I, I tend to look at those things, and we should look at those things. I encourage my kids as they're thinking about future spouses someday to look at those things. Are the people around them grateful or hateful? You know, are they like, oh, man, if you see that guy, you know, whatever. Is this person open, honest, accountable? Or as the Bible says here, are they secretive, defensive, presumptuous? You know, what's presumptuous? Self-willed. That's what it says there in verse 10. Doing their own thing. Hey, I don't care what anybody thinks. You can't tell me nothing. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And see, I've seen that a lot of what passes for faith in the Christian world sometimes, I just look at it and say, man, presumption. That's just presumption. That's self-will. Pride and presumption. You know, you hear these people making these bold, crazy, thus saith the Lord kind of things, you know, and claiming things that God has never said. I command in the name of Jesus this blah, blah, blah. God's given me a fresh revelation. Well, what's wrong with the revelation that's actually in the Bible? You know, it's the last book of the Bible there. That's a good one. See, popping people in the forehead, boom, you know, swinging things. Shenanigans, circus acts, man. And see, here's the thing. When I was a, a kid, my favorite superhero was Spider-Man. Any Spidey folks out there? All right, cool, represent. All right, now, one of his abilities was a Spidey sense, right? It was this little tingle that would go off in his head when one of his enemies was near or something wasn't right with the situation. Off would go the Spidey sense, you know, and I love that. I used to always think, man, I need that. And one of the things the Bible says about the Holy Spirit is that he will guide us into all truth and that we won't need somebody to say, hey, that's wrong, because God will say, hey, that's wrong, when it's wrong. And, you know, again, don't turn this into a whole doctrine, you know, that, hey, this is the spidey sense church or whatever. No, it, but it's almost like in the spirit, God gives us a spidey sense. If you really want to know the truth, you really want to know the truth, you get to know God's word, tingle, something's going to go off when there's something that isn't true. See, I love the way it works it's not just the people who know the Bible really well. It's people who want to know the God of the Bible really well. See, so often a new believer will come up to one of us. Hey, you know, Pastor Scott, I got a question. You know, I met this guy. He claimed to be a Christian. We started talking. I was really excited. It started off all good, you know, all this sort of stuff. Then, man, he started saying some stuff that I'd never heard before. I'd never heard any of you guys talk about it. I, You know, I don't know the Bible like you guys do, but, you know, he's quoting the Bible like crazy. But then I started thinking, man, he is crazy. He seemed really smart and all the rest. I, I don't know. It's like I got this sense that something wasn't right. And I tell him, good, good. That's the Lord protecting you against God fraud. That's a sure sign that the spidey sense is working. I like to use this illustration. You know, when they're training bank tellers, those in the banking world know that one of the things they do is they get to know the real thing really well. They just get to know that real bill, touch the real bills, you know, smell the real bills, lick the real bills, whatever, you know, just immerse yourself in real bills. You know, we're going to just bathe in them almost. And when a fake comes along, you don't know why, you don't know exactly what's wrong, you just know something's wrong. Something doesn't feel right, doesn't taste right. That's not a real bill. <laughs> See, here's the thing. There are a lot of fakes out there. You could devote your entire life to the fakes and never run out of options. See, there's just so many fakes, but there's one real deal. Get to know the real deal really well, and you won't fall for the false. Again, there are new fakes being invented all the time. New techniques to trick and take people off of the timeless truths of God's word. So simple. Just become really, really familiar with Jesus. So simple. And Peter in verse 11 uses an example of spiritual pride and presumption. You know, those who shout at the devil. Now, again, we could talk about a lot of different things, but I want to talk about the one Peter chose to talk about. He talks here about those who speak evil of dignitaries. What's it talking about there? It's talking about someone, again, who's saying stuff like, we're going to stomp on the devil tonight. I rebuke you. That kind of stuff. You heard it? I'm not making this stuff up, am I? Great cross-reference to write down, Jude. He only has one uh, chapter there, but what a chapter it is. Jude, verse 8, 9 and 10. He says, even angels don't do that nonsense. 
you know, they're smarter than that, that kind of idiocy. It says even the angels, if they need to say a rebuke, they say, the Lord rebuke you. I ain't doing anything with the demons and the devils, you know, and you just don't see that kind of nonsense in the Bible, but you see it in the church, and that's the sad part. See, I could go on and on again uh, about the fakes, about the ridiculous non-biblical things, but the bottom line is this. Again, just remember it so simply. Rotten root, rotten fruit. You just see the stuff. If it, I don't even know why it's wrong sometimes. I just know that it's wrong because I can see the outcome of it. Verse 12, but these, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of things they don't understand, and they will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. Having eyes full of adultery, they can't cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. Man, that's not very Christian talk, is it? That's pretty rough. But again, he's talking to God fraud there. And I don't have to name names. You know a lot of the names. That's the thing, because you know the names of people who sometimes have, have gotten to such an extent that people say, I'm just not even going to put up with that anymore. Now, I've read interviews with people who were once God fraud people and later came clean. And you know what they say? There's a common thread to a lot of it. They basically say this. I had a sense of spiritual superiority. I thought I was God's man for the moment. You know, that kind of thing. I'm God's anointed. Nobody can touch me. You know, and they had some false, crazy doctrine, self thing that got them all off this stuff. Maybe started with a right motive somewhere, but along the way, engaging in sins, you know, sins of pride, but pretty soon just outright wickedness. And they would keep preaching, keep talking about righteousness. And meanwhile, their life was full of unrighteousness. And I think there's a madness that has to happen in a person's mind and heart and soul for that to really happen. And so they begin to think, hey, nobody can touch me. Nobody can bring me down. Look, I can even sin. And it, God keeps using me. That kind of stuff. More and more bold and brazen. I've seen these stories. They break our hearts. It's almost like they're daring someone to stop the madness, you know? I dare you to take me down, you know? And God does. It says, verse 15, they have forsaken the right way. They've gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey, speaking with a man's voice, restrained the madness of the prophet. Now, again, hopefully you know where this is found, Genesis 22, 23, 24. We're not going to study those three chapters. That's a whole study unto itself. But what was Balaam's way here? I'm sorry, I just told you a heresy. It's Numbers 22, 23, 24. Ha! You know, someone would have come up to me later and said, you actually lied to us. My wife would have gotten me. She's my fact checker. But Numbers 22, 23, 24. Balaam's way. He was a prophet for profit. Rebuked by a donkey. Now, because of the way my mind works, I can never think of it except with uh, Eddie Murphy's voice, you know, Shrek and Donkey now. <laughs> I just, the rest of my life, I always think Shrek and Donkey, you know. But key life lesson here, okay? This should seem obvious, but maybe not to some people. If a donkey tells you it's time to repent, it's time to repent, all right? I mean, Balaam's a guy who's arguing with a donkey, and you think, okay, who's the bigger donkey here? You know, Balaam was a man who could be bought. You pay, I pray. That's what it was. A man with a price. And there's an old story about a rich man who came to a woman and asked her if she would marry him for a million dollars. She said, a million dollars? Sure. And he said, okay, well, would you sleep with me for 10 bucks? She was offended. What kind of lady do you think I am? And he said, well, I already found out what kind of lady you are when you accepted my million-dollar offer. All we're doing now is negotiating your best price. See, and you think about that, Balaam had a price. Now, it's easy for us to 
look at other people and say, yeah, man, I can't believe how they sold their soul for that. But this is a great question, searching our soul to ask, do I have a price? Do you have a price? Because know this, if you have a price for compromise, if you have a price that Satan could offer you that you would change how you live and what you believe, oh, he'll be very happy to pay that price. He'll be happy to come up with it somewhere along the line. And you think about this in the next part here. I almost have to take a deep breath as I, as I hit these things because it's like, wow, um, it's strong tonight. Verse 17, these are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. I don't know about you, but again, I, I kind of feel like saying, hey, Peter, you know, don't hold back, man. What do you really think about the false teachers? I mean, you know, blackness of darkness forever. And again, though there are laughing things about it, certainly, I take this subject so very seriously. Why? Because souls are at stake. See, I've invested my whole life, my whole family's life, in speaking and spreading and living the truth of Jesus. And you know what? I put a premium on learning it, on teaching it, on living it, simply and clearly. Why? Because I know that there's a heaven, and I know that there's a hell, and I know that people will spend eternity somewhere. There's no in-between, and there's a choice there. And if somebody is a fraud, well, I know where they're going, but guess what? The Bible just said many will follow them. And maybe they'd say, well, I'm no fraud, but you followed a fraud. You bought a lie. And even if it wasn't a religious lie, there's people who buy intellectual lies. There's people who buy all kinds of lies. There's a million counterfeits. There's only one truth, which is Jesus. And the darkness forever. Man. If that doesn't sober us up somehow, see, God frauds are everywhere, and their words do not lead to life. It says there, wells without water. I don't know if you've ever been really, really thirsty. There's a park by our house that as long as we've known it, it's had a water fountain, and as long as we've known it, there's no water that comes out of that fountain. But I still try. Every time I go, you know, you get on the bike, and you're like, ah, ah, nothing. But hope springs eternal. You know, you're like, maybe sometime. That's it, just push out and sand comes out. You know, that's the spiritual picture here. God frauds promise living water, they deliver drought. That's what happens in people's life. And the end of it all, darkness forever. See, I have a test for doctrine. I like to talk with people this way. You know, when people come, and they do come to us, sometimes very innocently, but with, hey, what do you think about this? Because someone told me this. And I always say, who told you that? Where'd you get that? Did you get it here? Well, no, I was talking with a guy. Who, oh, yeah, I thought so. Well, I was reading this guy's book, and he, uh, yeah, I thought so. Would you have come to this conclusion, this doctrine, without that person's influence? Well, no, I don't suppose so. If you just read the Bible for yourself, would you come to that conclusion? Do people who read the Bible for themselves come to that? No, but see, this guy's a prophet, and God's given him some revelation, and oh, man. If the answer is no, you wouldn't come to this conclusion just from reading the Bible, well then throw it out because it's not from the Bible. See, verse 18, it says, they speak great swelling words. What's that mean? They're very influential. Sometimes people are very smooth with their words. Swelling words, not of God, but of emptiness. Oh, wow. People go, wow, that was just so awesome. Well, where, do you remember anything from it? No, but man, it was so motivational. That guy's just so phenomenal, you know, but did he get it from the Bible? No, 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 no. They allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. Now, this verse right here, verse 18, says something so very interesting. And ask yourself when you're listening to teachers, do they take you to the Bible? Do they take you through the Bible? Do they have you look at it for yourself? Or do they just sort of launch off from some verse somewhere and go nuts after that? See, false teachers especially like to go after new and vulnerable people. That's what it says right here. Those who have actually escaped, those who live in error. He's saying they target that. They're not targeting the heathens. They're targeting the newbies sometimes. 
those who have recently escaped a worldly life. You know, I read a story of a priest who was having sex with young ladies who were wanting to go into godly service. They would come to him and tell him about how they wanted to serve God and how they really wanted to live a godly life. And he, through his influence on them, through his position, well, this is what he would do. He would tell them to pretend that it was Jesus caressing them, that it was Jesus doing this to them, kissing them and all the rest. Sick, man, that's sick. It ought to outrage us. But the worst part about it, as I was reading the story, there was no repentance at all at this point in the guy's life. He'd been found out and everything else, and all this had come down on him, and he was still justifying himself. No remorse, saying, look, I was doing them a favor. I was helping them get closer to God, and I stand by that, you know? Again, I'm not bashing by using the word priest there, you know, the Catholic priest. That's not the point. The problem is so much wider than that. What I'm bashing is what God's bashing here, which is God frauds. And it was a problem in Peter's day, and it's a problem in our day, using God's name for personal gain, using spiritual cover for lewd and evil things. And again, I always share with people, and I always come back to these very simple things, the three Gs. When I talk with guys about ministry, I say these are the things to watch out for, the three Gs, gold, girls, and glory. Those are the things that have ruined more people. Again, not because girls are wrong, but because the, the point is, if you go after the money or the sexual things or the pride and the glory, those are the things that have been taking down people from the beginning. Money, sex, and power. Those are the things to watch for, for the rotten root and the rotten fruit in something. Very important to see. Pay special attention to how somebody who claims to be something spiritually Ask yourself, what have they done? What are they doing with those areas of their life? And then verse 19, it says, while they promise people liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. So they promise freedom, but all they deliver is bondage. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he's brought into bondage. For if, after they've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they're again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy command delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog returns to his own vomit, and a, a pig, a sow, having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Again, I said there were some strong words, some kind of graphic language in here, maybe a PG rating at least. But turning your back here on God and going after a fraud, what's he saying here? Peter said it's like a dog going back to its vomit. Now, if you have a pet... You know exactly what he's talking about. You know where a dog will go, Bleh. hey, that looks good. And, uh, oh, and you go, Pastor Scott, how could you say that? That's so gross. Well, it should be gross. I hope you never forget what God just said about that. That's what he said it's like for you to have tasted the simple truth of Jesus and to go, yeah, but there must be more than that. There must be something else. And there are a lot of gross things that go on in God's name. I know that's true, but know this, God is no fraud. See, that's the third and final point I want to leave with you tonight. Believers must be unbelievers also. Learn to discern there. When you see rotten fruit, you know there's a rotten root and you can get away from that. But I want to end on a very positive note here tonight, which is God is no fraud. There's a lot of God fraud out there, but God is no fraud. Jesus is true. God's word is true. And when the Bible is taught simply and when it is lived and followed simply, people are set free. People are brought to life through the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. And the church, so-called, so often loves to make it very, very, very complex. And in the process, lose the life of Christ. And one of the most dangerous things in the world is to get a little inoculation to the truth. See, that's what happens with vaccines, right? You get just a little bit of it so you never get the real thing. And so often people out there have been inoculated in a sense 
by Jesus. They think they have encountered Jesus, and that's a person that's really hard to reach because they're like, been there, done that. And I am always shocked at what people who've walked away from the simplicity of Christ, what they walk into. You see them years later, hey, haven't seen you around for a while. What you into? Man, UFOs are coming, man. I shaved my head and, and my, you know, my four wives and 28 kids, man, we're, we're heading out to get some, some Kool-Aid over at the store, you know, and you're, oh boy. Maybe it's not that weird, but maybe it's just plain old-fashioned cynicism. Oh man, you know, I tried Jesus, it didn't work. Well, can I say this clearly? If it didn't work, it wasn't Jesus, because Jesus works. There's a whole lot of testimony to that in this room and in my own life and all throughout history. Jesus works. And so if you think you've come to Jesus and it hasn't worked, well, hey, maybe you came to some person's view of what Jesus is all about, but to just simply come to him and devote your life to him and say, God, just fill me, use me, teach me your word, help me to love people like you love them, man, I want to be honest. Yeah, I'm flawed, but I don't want to be a fraud, Lord. I, I, I'm humbled by who I am and who I've been, but God, I know what you have for me. Well, that's a whole different story. Now, remember the question that I asked there at the beginning? How would you feel? How would you feel if someone took your identity? Well, you know, in most cases, we'd be mad, right? But actually, there is one type of identity theft that you want to happen to you that you need to have happen to you. Now you might say, what are you talking about there? Well, I'm talking about the greatest identity theft ever, which is when Jesus took your identity as a sinner. When he says, I I'll take your identity. I'll trade places with you on the cross. This is the way the Bible puts it. God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of of God. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. You see right there a switcheroo. See, you had a debt that you could not pay. I had a debt that I could not pay. Maxed out, you know, bankrupt morally in sin. And Jesus came and took my place, took my identity. He says, I'll identify with a sinner. I'll take his place. And you might say, well, why would he do that? Why would he want to do that? Why would he want my identity as a sinner, as a, as a person on their way to hell? Well, the Bible says love. That's the very thing lacking in the con men, in the false teachers, in the false prophets, the God frauds, love. Self-sacrifice. Putting of another person ahead of yourself. And see, here's the best part of it, I think which is Jesus not only takes your identity as a sinner, that would be wonderful in and of itself, but he gives you his identity as a son, as a daughter. He invites you into the family. And now when God looks at you, guess what he sees? Not your sin, but his son. He sees Jesus. This is awesome. Not a fraud when he sees my life. Not even flawed when he sees my life. But Jesus, well... Because he took my place, God sees me just as if I were Jesus. My sin, my moral bankruptcy, my failure, of which there are many, now his. It's on him. His good name, his spiritual riches, his righteous reputation, now mine. And when God looks at me, again, he sees not my sin, but his son, and it's not coming by fraud. It's not coming from me grasping it. It's from God giving it by faith in Jesus. That's what the Bible teaches. So simple, so true. If you're here tonight and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, let me give you a challenge here, which is don't let God frauds keep you from God. Don't let some hypocrite keep you out of heaven. God is no fraud. There's a lot of God frauds out there, but God is no fraud. Jesus is real, and he's the real deal. And the fact that there are so many God frauds only proves the value of what God has said when he sent his son. Think about it this way. Nobody counterfeits monopoly money. Nobody's out there pumping out fake pennies, you know? Nobody's making knockoffs of cheap watches and no-name merchandise. 
People counterfeit real money. People make fake Rolexes, not fake Timexes. Why? Because frauds only fake valuable things. And so if there are God frauds out there, well, of course there are. There will always be, absolutely. But don't let them keep you from God. Don't let that be your excuse like it was for me for so many years. Before I came to Christ, that was my standard excuse. You know, it worked pretty well. I got rid of a lot of Christians that way. Oh, well, what about all the fakes? What about all the hypocrites? What about all the frauds? I mean, I have several examples. You know, look at human history. Look at some of the things that have been done in the name of Jesus. I don't believe in all that. Look at the junk that goes on in Jesus' name. Well, you know what, though? It's exactly what I just said it was. It, it was an excuse. Because there comes that moment when Jesus kind of blows away all that smoke and says, yeah, but what about me, Scott? You may have seen a lot of God fraud, but when you look at me, what's your complaint? Again, don't let the God frauds keep you from God. For those who are frauds, well, Peter made it plain darkness, blackness of darkness forever. And as we saw tonight, sadly, many, even if they're not frauds, will follow them. But see, this is the great news here tonight, which is those who are gods, those who are gods, not darkness of blackness forever, but light and life forever. That, to me, seems like a pretty obvious choice you know you don't have to get too complex in that one don't have to do a lot of analysis of that one there's truth there's lies there's freedom there's bondage and the choice is ours and so what I want to do here tonight is what we do every time we're here because one of the major reasons we're here is to try to give this simple truth to people so what I want to do is close out with a time here it's an invitation an invitation to a choice to a declaration for to a decision in your life to make a choice between God and not God. Those are the real only two choices. And as you face that choice, just know that God is the one reaching out to you. You know, it's not about joining this church or joining a religion. It's not about following a priest or a pastor or a person. Like so many people, it's sometimes easier to follow a person. You know, you say, give me somebody to give me all the answers. You know, Jesus just came to say, I am the answer. You know, I'm actually the one. A relationship with the God who created you is what you're looking for. And again, if, if there's some sense that you say, well, I, I thought I'd tried that. I thought I'd been there, but it didn't work. Well, let me remind you, if it was Jesus, Jesus works. And so I'm just going to invite us to close our eyes, bow our heads. And if you're here tonight and you know you need to make that life altering decision and declaration that you want to come to Christ. Again, we don't believe we're the only church and beware of anyone who does. We don't think we're the only people who've got it right. We probably got a lot of things wrong. We're flawed. But let me tell you what I'm calling you to is what God's calling you to, which is a relationship with God. Pointing you past us and onto him. That's what we're always going to be about here. And if we're ever not, Hey, rebuke us. And so with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, if you know you need God here tonight, you know you need to settle the issues of eternity, you want a relationship with God, you want forgiveness of your sin, you want to know that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. Well, the Bible says that the way you do that is by coming to Christ in faith. And so what you need to do is, first of all, just admit you're flawed. Admit you're a sinner. That shouldn't be too hard. Admit that you've made some mistakes. Admit that you've fallen short of God's glory, that you're not perfect like God is perfect. But to go beyond that, then the next thing the Bible says is that you need to believe, that you need to believe that you're the problem, but God's the solution. You know, and that he sent his son to, deal for your, to pay for your sin, to deal with your sin, to believe in Jesus. And then finally, to commit your life to him. To say, I want to follow you. I want to do things your way, not my way. I want to follow after you. I want to trust in you. And if that's your heart here today, I'm just going to give you an opportunity to raise your hand in your seat and make that declaration here tonight. Anybody who wants to make that declaration that you need Jesus in your life, just go ahead and raise your hand wherever you're sitting. 
settle the issue of eternity. I see you there. God bless you. In the back also, God bless you. Anyone else here tonight? Don't let the time pass. This is such an important moment. Those of you who know the Lord, just be praying for those who are making decisions here. I see you there in the front. God bless you. Anyone else? Back here. Over here. God bless you. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to lead you in a prayer here tonight. It's a prayer of commitment to Christ. Very simple. And I pray that these words, Lord, would be just the start of a new beginning. You see the hearts, Lord, that are here tonight. So those who raised your hand, just pray this prayer with me. God, I thank you for sending your son to die for my sin. Lord, I thank you that you made it simple. I need you. And I pray that you would forgive me and that you would give me the life that you promised. I want to follow you this day and forever. Be my God, my Savior, and my friend. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. What I'm going to do here is ask those of you who raised your hand uh, just to, to make a bold step here tonight. What it is is just as, as Nate is closing us out here tonight, I'm just going to ask you, if you raised your hand, you prayed that prayer, I'm going to walk right down here and I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat as we uh, all stand, just get up out of your seat and come down here to the front. You might be saying, well, man, that's going to make me uncomfortable. That's going to be difficult. Well, it might be difficult. But you know what? It's going to also set you free. There's such an amazing thing that happens in our life when we say, you know what? I'm not ashamed of a declaration there. I know this. When I wanted to marry my wife, I said I do, and I would have said it in front of everyone. I didn't keep it a secret. I didn't say, well, you know, let's have a wedding somewhere where nobody's watching. No. And I'd stand in front of anybody and say, hey, I, I love this woman. I want to live my life with her. And that's all we're giving you an opportunity to do is to make a public declaration. Jesus died for you publicly. He lives for us publicly. And it's such a wonderful thing when we will do that same thing, dying to our own life, old life, alive to the new. So I'm just going to ask us all to stand. If you raised your hand, come on down. Uh, we'd love to give you that opportunity in a Bible. For you. So I wait for you, I am falling on my knees, offering all of me, Jesus, your oldest heart is living.